Let me introduce a little bit of uh, what's happening. We, we are in the middle of a, a New Orleans International Guitar Festival, right? Which is very exciting. And uh, today is day two. We started yesterday with a great um, uh, performance by Giovanni Santos at the Jazz Museum and Mahmoud Chuki. So they were representing Morocco and Brazil. And uh, then we had the winner for the Elias Barreiro Young Artist Competition um, a perform a concert. A recital was really well attended to at Dixon Recital Hall. And then we had Cuban music at Rock and Bowl, and that was fun. So the festival is just that, a mixture of different types of music, different types of genres, different types of instruments even, even though they're related to the guitar family. Um, what we try to do is always include a little talk about music. So this gives me the opportunity to um, just talk with and get the experiences of these great artists that I have here with me and great scholars, right? Um, about just music, it's very informal. Um, we've done in the past the guitar in New Orleans, how it evolved, that was last year. We also talked about um, the, the, the teacher, the tutor, the mentorship part of the professor um, one year. So it's always been really fun. Come on in. Uh, it's always been uh, so much fun to, to listen to, um, you know, uh, everybody to talk about their experiences. Mm -hmm. Today, we have chosen for this year, we have chosen, uh, I know it's a very hard or it's a very broad topic, uh, songwriting, songwriting with a guitar as a, as a start, right? But um, so the idea was to bring that um, historical um, uh, context, you know, where um, we, we talk about the troubadours and traverse, you know, from the 1100s even, uh, where they were so uh, important as such a source of information, right? And uh, how they went town and town and how with the lutes and other instruments, they developed um, a, a genre that later it just stayed, right? Um, so I have questions uh, for each one of uh, the, our guests today, and I'm gonna be like a little bit like the moderator. I just want to first uh, always thank uh, Lisa Hooper because she always gives us the opportunity to be here. And I think that including the, the library is very important because this is such a great, um, we have great resources of the music library that we still have to really get it across to the <laughs> students where they know that they can find all sorts of things in the music library. So I always try to um, give you like that <laughs> a commercial you know, <laughs> uh, uh, spot. But uh, we're very happy to be here, and, and this is a wonderful place, too. So thanks so much for giving us the space and, and facilitating this. So I would like to start with, uh, with John, I, since I have you here right here on my left. So why don't you tell us about the process of creation, you know, like songwriting, in your own experience with your original music, with your original songs? How does it start? What, what influences do you have? And, and stuff like that. Well, uh, there are different types of writers. I'm mostly an inspiration writer. I don't uh, write for projects very often. Uh, and it usually starts with a very small idea. And then some ideas can be developed. I have, you know, tons of one lines, you know, that I think are gonna make a great song, but they don't. So I do instrumentals and uh, uh, vocal songs, primarily I'm the one singing them. And uh, I'm focused, the success of a, of a song depends on if I've expressed my emotion clearly. And if I have enough, for me, if I have enough imagery to, to get the song over, because I think some songs are conversations when you're talking to somebody um, you are the sunshine of my life is a mm -hmm. conversation and some songs are stories, you know, and some songs are combinations of those. But with story songs, particularly uh, imagery is really important and having active words and, and things. So I try and write, overwrite when I first sit down with an idea. And then uh, because that's that creative state where you accept everything. And then the next day, most of it looks like garbage. But I'll put a little, you know, dot by the lines that I like, and then I start over again from there. I have the idea, I can see the lines and see what's wrong with them. So <clears throat> some songs write themselves very quickly, 
And those are frequently my favorite songs that are done in a half an hour or an hour or two hours. That's quickly for me. Uh -huh. And other things just have to incubate and work on and work on. And, uh, and you just revisit them until you feel that it's, mm -hmm. it's done. And sometimes I revisit, revisit really old songs that I know don't work and try and figure out why they don't work. Mm -hmm. And I make them better. They may never be performable, but at least I make them better. You uh -huh. know? It's a process. Yes. you got to love the process, uh -huh. just like practicing. What, what kind of, um, of role does a guitar have in your songwriting, in your personal experience? So the guitar as an instrument, does it play a factor? Oh, absolutely. Uh, and I, uh, I used to write on the piano, which, of course, is much more transparent. Uh, but some songs start with music and some with the lyric idea. The ones that start with music tend to be more complex, uh, both musically and lyrically. Mm -hmm. um, so, yeah, I, all, all the styles that I learn, I write songs in uh, kind of a swing or a traditional New Orleans repertoire, and we'll do some of those Friday night. Uh -huh. uh, and I write songs uh, with, uh, well, a lot of Brazilian mm -hmm. changes and chords. And, then I have what I call my John Prine songs, which are three and four chord songs that usually um, really rely on having a very clear lyric, mm -hmm. sometimes humor. Mm -hmm. So you do feel that the language that you have in your mind for your song will you know, translate into you using either instrument, the piano or the guitar, or any other instrument? Well, I've, I've kind of marketed myself in New Orleans as a solo guitarist, mm -hmm. and I play with bands, but primarily I play solo. Um, so the guitar is my voice, mm -hmm. you know, uh, and I try and have a good arrangement on the guitar, mm -hmm. you know, and no, I, I write through the guitar completely. Okay. But your first source of inspiration doesn't necessarily be the guitar or is the guitar. That's correct. Right. Okay. Um, I'd like to talk to, uh, Anna a little bit about the context of the, of the song writing when it's done, when the song is done, you know, um, how the song now is uh, available for everybody to, to the consumer, you know, to listen and all that, and how it can bring um, even social change, you know, during the years and the, the, the famous uh, songwriters and performers in Latin America that we have talked about, you know, uh, Violeta Parra and, and some, some others that then transcend even their countries, their genres, their, their folk music, right? And bring it to other places. Right. So, uh, first of all, thank you for inviting me, Javier, and congratulations to Lisa, too, and to the library for uh, putting on this event, and to the Guitar Festival uh, in general. It's a pleasure to uh, host part of this in the music department and in the Tulane Library. So, um, I, you don't know that, but I actually wrote my dissertation, <laughs> no. which I never published on singing songwriting traditions in Colombia and how they fit or didn't fit in terms of protest music, what we th have thought of as uh, La Nueva Cancion or La Nueva Trova. So Colombia is a weird country. It doesn't fit, it, it never fit either La Nueva Cancion or La Nueva Trova because it was between the Caribbean <laughs> and the most Southern Cone tradition. So the new song movement is usually thought about as you know, Chile, then you have the Tropicalia or, or MPB version of Brazil, and then you have Nueva Trova in Cuba. And then there's all these traditions that get excluded or these practices that get excluded from, uh, you know, this recognition of the musical and social significance. So I want to talk about two small histories. Um, first, highlighting the great influence that Violeta Parra had on so many singers, whether they belong to the new song tradition or not. So I want to just tell two stories about her. One is I have followed, I have not published anything about her, but I have, um, she was a, a, a very good friend of while I lived in New York for 20 years. Lucia Pulido is a, a Colombian singer who be, began in Bogota in the Nueva Trova, Nueva Cancion tradition. Uh, but they would play not only guitar, but all, we're also adapting a lot of the Caribbean percussive elements to the multiplicity of string instruments. She also grew up in the Eastern Plains of Colombia, Venezuela, where the cuatro is a very important instrument. So she learned to perform the cuatro. And then one day she was growing up in the Eastern Plains and she received a cassette. And that cassette had songs by Violeta Parra. And she said very young, that's what I want to be, right? So uh, said and done. And then she eventually, so she grew up in Bogota in this singing up 
you know, urban tradition, 1970s, 1980s, they would not invite them to sing, uh, you know, the huge festivals of the Nueva Canción because they were not officially, uh, you know, from the Communist Party. And also because they mixed a lot of Caribbean music in their traditions. So, you know, in, in, in the way they would do it. So it was like they fit, but they didn't fit. So they never got invited. So then she migrated to New York City and there she began working with a series of musicians uh, Japanese, Colombian, and otherwise, who had worked with Colombian percussive, Afro-Colombian Afro percussive traditions, and had were translated them into the bass and the guitar. So I also want to think about the guitar as the as this multi instrument that is able to absorb, you know, the notion of percussion that is so central, uh, and as as well as other string tradition, traditions from different parts of the, let's say. Uh, Arabic and Iberian world, you know, and so she frequently uh, sings with this incredible voice that she trained with a series of also um, uh, singing teachers that train in vocal styles that are necess not necessarily operatic. She has an incredible voice. I really encourage you to look for her online and um, often accompanied by professional cuatro players who also were living in New York and forming an uh, avant-garde career. So I want to give her as an example of how these traditions sort of spill over to singing songwriting in a way that involves, on the one hand, rewriting your songs, but it often also involves taking the traditional music as the singer, you know, the Nueva Canción often did, and creating a new instrumental context for it. And sort of that meant, has meant bringing the guitar and the cuatro and the tiple and the, all of these instruments to a new, let's say, avant-garde milieu. So that's one, one story. And do I have time to tell a second story? Absolutely. Okay. Absolutely. So I have, a, you know, like a, a nephew who grew up in Pittsburgh and New Jersey and then decided he wanted to study music, study music in New York City and stayed in New York City. And he's a singer-songwriter from the indie rock tradition, let's say, let's put it that way, okay? One of his bands is called Panther Hollow, but he has many other bands. And then when he gives interviews, he says that he became a singer-songwriter because he was growing up and his parents were listening to Mercedes Sosa, eh, Silvio Rodriguez, you know, all these songs. And he says that's, that's why he became a singer-songwriter. So you would never think of Latinx-influenced indie rock uh, in New York City as having anything to do with this singing song. And he's also an excellent guitarist. Uh, and he does that singing songwriting tradition. He composes on the guitar uh, and, um, you know, composes these songs, beautiful, beautiful songs. And so um, you never would think that indie rock had anything to do. So I want to like pluralize how we think about these histories and the multiple sort of genealogies that, that sort of come into them. So that's, those are my two short stories um, about the, you know, like rethinking the broad context of this singing songwriting tradition, which is so, so important in, in Latin America. Yes, wonderful stories. And I do want to point out that um, we are recording, we're documenting this also because um, this will stay in the archives of the, of the library, the music library, and it'll be also maybe a starting point for anybody interested to listen, to, to hear the names that we are all mentioning, for them to go and research even more about it. Um, Giovanni Santos is a, is a Brazilian uh, composer, guitarist, musician, and, uh, and friend, of course. But um, Giovanni, I want to hear your intake. So uh, Ana talked a little bit about the, per the percussion in the guitar, right? And I'm sure in Brazil we, you have those influences, and I'm sure you also have the innovation with the harmonies during the years with the jazz harmonies that we all are aware of with Brazilian music, you know? Can you tell us about some songwriters that incorporate that or in your experience and your knowledge? Uh, uh, good morning, everybody. Thank you for inviting me. Uh, Javier is my boss in the music department. Uh, I'm a professor of classical guitar in the music department. Uh, the, the, the tradition of a uh, singer-songwriter in Brazil, you know, is like something that comes from the Iberian and the rapizodo, you know, like the, the whole thing of like the trovador. That's is like it's old that comes from uh, the, the Iberian Peninsula and just like translates into people 
uh, doing poetry or, or even like protest songs within the, the empire and satirical songs that translates into, you know, not translate, but transitions into the, the, the whole thing of people actually starting doing urban music in the early 19th century, not 19th, uh, uh, early 19th century and then uh, early 20th century. But the, the whole thing of uh, mixing in harmonies, as you said, you know, something that starts off, it starts off with, the, with the boom of jazz in the, in the 1920s. And the first meetings that uh, Brazilian music has with jazz, I would say, uh, are the, the, the excursions that you have of, of cruise ships that stop in Brazil and go to Argentina and just like do the, instead of going to the Panama Canal because it was being built, they would just like go around and back. So a lot of times people would stop in, in uh, Rio de Janeiro and that's where, you know, like jazz music was being uh, infused in Brazilian music. So you have a little bit of that starting to happen in 1920s with the music of Choro. Pixinguinha is one of the first musicians to actually include some of this language on his music. Further, you have uh, the, the uh, resurgence of like big band music being imposed in uh, uh, popular music in Brazil, like in the 1930s. And then you have Kami Miranda and this whole uh, influence of the, the expansion of American culture in Brazil uh, with, uh, with the in between, uh, in between wars and like the end of the, the First World War and the beginning of the Second World War. And uh, just like moving forward, you have uh, also the, the creation of hybrid rhythms that uh, include like doo-wop and also a little bit of like the swing music in Brazilian music, like in the 1950s-ish. But uh, uh, what you asked me about like the, the rich harmonies of jazz uh, that are included on the music of Brazil, it's like they are actually uh, really prominent with this musician named uh, Johnny Alf in the beginning of the 1950s because he's, uh, I would say, the first modern musician in the history of uh, Brazilian popular music that was able to do a crossover to mix both languages, both uh, Brazilian popular music and jazz. And he is, I would say, the, the initiator of Bossa Nova. So all the Bossa Nova tradition kind of like drinks from from his source as a as a as an inspiration but in the end he's kind of forgotten because when bossa nova kind of blew up he was not in rio de janeiro specifically so he was a little bit forgotten and uh, disregarded as somebody who was the creator of it but like he was more or less the person who who actually brought this this language in in my process i would say you know it's like i try to incorporate the the music of jazz on the Brazilian writing because I am inserted in the context that jazz music is the music that I play the most and the music that I appreciate the most and keeping the lyricism that we have in Brazilian music uh, with uh, easy singable lines with uh, crunchy harmonies underneath it is something that like I, I try to do just like trying to mirror the way uh, Edu Lobo does music. Uh, Antonio Adolfo is, is, is a pianist composer that also does such things and you have like beautiful melodies with very intricate harmony and rhythms underneath. You have also Moacir Santos who's also like a, a, a wonderful composer that does like big band arrangements of, of uh, Afro music, Afro, Afro religious music from Brazil with this context of like big band and, and, and jazz. His, he, was, uh, he was like contemporary of Harry Mancini writing music for film in, New York, uh, in, in Hollywood in the 1970s. And, uh, and I would say uh, that it's very easy to get super complicated like uh, uh, John was saying earlier. And it's like, it's, you're just like trying to show everything you have in terms of like technique and and knowledge of, of harmony and, you know, it's like trying to do too much, but in the end, you know, it's like you might be writing the music for yourself, but not for an audience to, to listen to. Right. So I think a lot of the music that's very uh, uh, successful that blends these languages, both like popular music and jazz, you know, like trying to be modern 
on the on the new traditions of songwriting in Brazil, they are successful because they have this balance of what it is, you know, in terms of like the writing of the lyrics and the melody and whatever else, you know, that they trying to not complicate too much on, on, on the musical part, the instrumental part. Right, right. And, and speaking more, not the, the musical part itself, but uh, more of the lyrics and the language, how are social aspects reflected in the songwriting in Brazil? Can you talk about some uh, notorious songwriters that include social aspects like maybe poverty, maybe, you know, despair or disparities, right? Um, poverty and despair and, and inequality has always been part of uh, Brazilian songwriting, be it, you know, like in the, in the flip of this, the, the 1800s to the 1900s with folks uh, talking about corrupt, uh, corrupt governments and uh, uh, the, the whole uh, relationship between races. That was something that uh, is, is off and on uh, treated in Brazil as something that is not a problem, but some people saw it. Uh, Gregório de Matos was a, a, a composer of the 1800s. He talked about that like uh, at length, not only in the context of like the the daily life of of being a mestizo man, but also in the context of uh, of like the religious spaces where you would have preachers having uh, uh, sexual relationships with with women, which was something that was seen as wrong, but since they were in Brazil and not being overseen by the by the Pope, they could do it. It was like something that he criticized as something that was wrong in that aspect. And uh, the music of uh, the 19th century that has lyrics, not only in the 20th century that has lyrics in the very beginning part of it, they always talk about social issues, about uh, being black, living on the margins of society. The music that actually has uh, this kind of context which is the music of samba and mashishi they're talking about these things but then with the with the, the rise of of Yutulu Vargas in the 1930s this kind of language is 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 kind of put aside because you actually saying something to the government that want people to actually think about which is uh, inequality and the inefficiency of the state to provide for the people so all of these these conversations about you know like oh I'm poor and I live in this this specific neighborhood or you know uh, I have money for 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 a beer but I don't have money for for a pack of beans so to speak change for the uh, idealization of Brazil as uh, a nation of wonders which is the uh, the entire 1930s and 1940s but then uh, this start to change a little bit on the on the 50s. Because you have the 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 walk back to to democracy and people start to talk a little bit of social issues, but not too much because uh, you don't have too much space for that and not too much of a of a of a motivation, so to speak, because the the country is is, is undergoing a lot of uh, changes for the better with modernization processes with the with the new government. But in the '60s. You have a flip because folks start to to invest in social change and and protests and in, in, in songwriting more effectively and more emphatically. Um, Anna, as a woman, right, and celebrating now uh, Women's uh, History Month, um, I would like to hear your intake also about you know like uh, we talked about Violeta Parra how do you think it was for her in the context of being somebody from Chile that was able to, um, you know, analyze or, you know, make world famous a lot of the genres that she did and in, in, the, in the folk music of Chile, but also as a woman, uh, how do you think that affected her or any songwriter, women, Mercedes Sosa per se, or, or anybody else that, that, you know, that maybe didn't have the opportunity to have that exposure worldwide? Yeah. <clears throat> Well, you know, I think that's a little bit of a complex question <laughs> in the sense that um, on the one hand, I think a lot of these women had um, very strong willed presence. <laughs> um, so, you know, uh, like if you follow the history of Violeta, it's like she's imposing herself on a lot of spaces, some of, some of which are 
analyzed contradictorily in historical terms. Uh, so, and I think also of singers who are not necessarily songwriters, but they were key to the emergence of the figure of the songwriter, somebody like Elis Regina, for example, who's not recognized as a songwriter, but her voice, the, the voice of women as a key figure of the singer-songwriter tradition that often do not get recognized for their creativity, but just for their you know, fame or production. And I'm also thinking of countries we don't recognize, like for example, Lucecita in Puerto Rico. Um, so these are women that sort of and it's and I highly recommend this is a, a book by Alicia Fiol Mata, which is, which is called The Great Woman Singer, about all these female singers in Puerto Rico that have that were extremely famous, but nobody had written one single word about them. They are sort of you know there in obscurity. So I think that the first thing we need to do when we think about women singer songwriters is to complicate the figure because a lot of these songwriters depend on women <laughs> to actually have their songs sung in the way that they want them sung and to make them famous. Um, so I do want to bring in the voice of women and the, their, their incredible presence throughout history. And it's an untold history. And many of these women we do not know about. And they are not brought into the fold of a singer-songwriter tradition but their voice and their development and their vocal presence would not have been there had the singer-songwriter tradition not existed. So it's a, like a double take. So I really think that part of what we need to do is to have a more expansive notion of what creativity in music means, including what it means to cultivate the voice in such a way that a songwriter can count on those singers to do their creative work. So um, I think it's really, really important to have an expansive notion of who are the women that actually made this movement possible? Is it just the women that composed? And I'm not denigrating them at this point. I know Violeta is like a key figure that influenced everybody <laughs> everywhere. But at the same time, um, you have these other women singers like Lucecita, like Elise Regina, who are not necessarily composers, but they are composing in the way they use the voice. And they're changing the tradition in the way they use the voice and in the way they dress in the way they challenge how they were told that they were going to dress or be on stage or they had to be present by these you know mega companies and they challenge these traditions often at the expense of their own lives um, i often think of trying to juxtapose somebody like carmen miranda and violeta parra together and they people that sometimes are you crazy how are you going to put those two together but on the other hand they both carried on their shoulders the transformation of an era Right, and they both paid with their lives. You know, they had to. They had so much to change. They had so much to carry on their shoulders, and so much was put on their shoulders as to what they were, as to the changes that they were bringing about, and they were not recognized as such. I mean, Carmen Miranda was rejected at some point, and then Violeta Parra was alone in that tent she created at the end of their life in, in the middle of Santiago. They were both left alone in a way in the midst of a production system that did not care for them in the way that it cared for uh, you know, the male singer-songwriters. And, the, and they paid with their lives. So, you know, so even though they're very, very, very different singers and they, ins they insert themselves very differently in these traditions, they do so at, at they transformed the history of singing songwriting in Latin America. Both of them did. And they do so at the expense of their own lives. So I, I really, same with Elis Regina in a way, right? Mm -hmm. So I do want to you know, rethink this history of singing songwriter by including these multiple traditions of production mm -hmm. and bringing these women together sort of into a pantheon that we recognize as you know, a very broad pantheon and that singing songwriting also includes the cultivation of the voice. And uh, they're, you know, central in that place. So that's my, my Absolutely. two cents there. I yeah. love it. Um, and that brings to mind uh, my good friend Yusa. <laughs> Yusa, um, you come from, from a tradition of, uh, of songwriting. La vieja trova, eh, los boleristas, el feeling, ¿verdad? la nueva trova, Pablito, Silvio, la nuevísima trova, canción protesta, contestataria. Um, how does all that uh, play into your own uh, musical production? 
Well, in my case, it's kind of like uh, I have like a path very because my path come from the art of listening. That come from there, you know, because um, I I remember when I I grew up like surrounded by uh, you know like a neighborhood that neighborhood that they used to play the guitar. You know, and I remember my mother, as I, I she saw my interest in about the guitar, she bought a vinyl with a, a, a Leo Brower vinyl that there was the, the Bach, uh, a lot of Beatles, to Beatles. And I, that grabbed my attention because uh, when and, and when I heard that, I, I, I just thought I want to make that music, you know, I want to play classical guitar. And then I start like you know kind of searching about uh, Leo Brower and uh, and all the work about him. He made all the version music he was uh, bringing to the classical scene, and uh, for me that was the most important because I when I saw the guitar and I, I saw all those strings, that for me was kind of the sponge as the cultural sponge as Cuba is, you know, and that makes me feel that I wanted to do something with that, but just blend all that. And and so I was playing classical music for a long time also until I graduated. But then uh, it was the, the theater who, uh, you know, who grabbed my attention to, to make some lyrics about it because I, I love literature. So, and that was the theater who makes me do that, you know. Uh, and so I start like listening to music, listening to all the drama play, and I start working with the drama plays, you know, working with the greatest like Vicente Revuelta and Raquel Revuelta was the, the greatest, you know, uh, figures about the theater in Cuba. And, uh, and that I start just like, you know, uh, uh, bringing all kind of sources because that's how Cuba is. And, and at the same time, it was kind of my need, you know, as a, as a, as a creative, uh, uh, creative uh, person, you know, and so that I, I bring the art of listening because, for example, I talk a lot and, uh, and used to talk, talk a lot, but I, but for me, that's kind of, it's, it's like a necessity, you know, but when do you, when do you, uh, listen in this kind of an art, you know, and, uh, and that, that art of listening is what makes you, uh, you know, brings what you, what that fits you on the, on a certain time, you know, and, uh, and, and I just made the music that fits myself and, you know, bringing all the literature I read, even like being like connected with a uh, great figures at, at Vector Monti or, or, at, uh, you know, or a Meto Pascual that they bring all that kind of, you know, a uh, uh, blend in the, into music, you know. And uh, and that's when I start with my first, you know, I, I was, uh, you know, listen, listen to John, I was, yes, sometimes uh, you have those, those lines and you just start and you say, oh my God, that's going to be amazing. And then it's, it's, been, it's been for two months and nothing happened with that, you know. And then, but at the same time, it's just trying to be honest, you know, how all the all the sources that I'm, I'm connected with, um, uh, you know, uh, can bring me uh, to a, a new song, and, and at the end, it's it's me who makes the, my own story and who who's making creating my own path, you know. And that's when I can go to you know certain sometimes the guitar, sometimes the the tres, sometimes the bass or the piano, because th those bring me div uh, brings me like a different kind of approaches, you know, and different kind of languages, you know. And that at the end is uh, those uh, that language is the the one who, who affect you know the way I the, the the way I am and the way people listen to music at the same time in this moment you know you know that's uh, what what strikes me most about you uh, is your openness that you're always willing to uh, collaborate with other uh, musicians with other totally other cultures I mean we saw that yesterday where you were playing with Mahmoud. Uh, so we had the North African and we had the Cuban music all together and, uh, and that's wonderful. So how is, does that, is that a, like a conscious effort that you do or is, or is something that comes to you or is something that you're just there and because you have people around you or, or is a little bit of everything? Yeah, the thing, I think uh, as, as, as you uh, told before about the troubadour, you know, the art of the troubadour is like you spreading the word, you know. You're just you know walk and and that's the the way we are we are a, a whole globe like full of music and that even the uh, uh, Mahmoud came here you know that music came here so and how can how can I skip that 
you know, how can I skip like, you know, John and making that beautiful music because that connects us, it connects us in, the, in history, in the, about the chrono, chr 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 chronological uh, way, you know. And for me, it's a, it's, a, 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 it's a need to collaborate because it's the way, I, you know, I, I made my own music and mostly I, I play my music, you know, but it's beautiful when I merge my music with other uh, culture, my music, you know, gets bigger, you know, because at the same time, all the people that connect with my music uh, gets in touch with that culture too, you know. Uh, and 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 I see as, as as even as a responsibility, you know, uh, as a as a musician, as an artist, uh, it's a responsibility to bring, you know, to to speak about all kind of language. Like for example, the, what have, what happened with the with the with the protest music and with even Violeta Parra and and many others. That if we didn't have to, to uh, it didn't connect with that roots, we will be lost right now, you know, in time about history. If John doesn't play that kind of music, that the, the music he plays, we, I, I will never have the chance to know about that uh, style of music or, or Giovanni that he brings all the culture, you know, everything all together, or you that brings us here, you know, to talk about it. That is so important because th this is a responsibility we have, you know. So um, I think that we need to be, uh, you know, together in order to be, you know, greater, you know, as, as human beings, you know. Cultural speaking, you know. Absolutely. Um, so, I mean, because of the uh, lack of time, I just want to make make sure that um, anybody, if they have any qu kind of questions for any of them, um, this will be a time to like questions. Take questions. Yeah. Elis Regina, maybe. Elis Regina, Violeta Parra, uh, Lucia Pulido. L-U-C-I-A and P-U-L-I-D-O. I'll send you a link. Um, okay. Do you have a question? <laughs> Manuel Arteaga, representante Venezuela. Uh, ciao. Um, I wanted to, uh, I heard all of you and uh, she just said, um, thank you very much for all of you and, and Javier for having all of you together because uh, it reminds us of, of how much is out there. It's not only, you know, m which is going to be my question in a second, but uh, <clears throat> it's not only writing songs. <laughs> but, um, um, and it is, it's, it's nice to see, which uh, I guess is mostly, uh, Latin America that we're talking about here, but um, and also the Arabic countries because uh, we were talking about Mahmoud too, um, and New Orleans right here, so represented. which is uh, New Orleans, New Orleans, <laughs> and uh, and the U.S. of course we're here. But my my um, and it's great to hear all of your versions because we forgot in the daily life we forgot we forgot about everybody. It's really interesting to hear all of your points. Uh, my question is. When I was coming here, I was thinking about the process of writing new music, you know? Every one of us that writes, we have a different approach of how to start. It can be uh, very creative, like one day you stop your driving and you stop and you write a new song, or it can be as a job, which for some of us is, is it needs to be taken that way as a job. You, you will... Uh, take a whole month or a week of writing songs or writing new poetry or writing something new. My question for you, if we have the time is, or briefly, how do you approach that? How about you, 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 you? How, how you approach your writing muse somehow? How would you do it? You want to start, Yusa? Well, in my case, it's kind of like, it's depending, you know, because I, I normally I don't I don't do uh, you know music as a job because uh, I've been doing this since I'm I don't know six, <laughs> so and uh, uh, but sometimes uh, uh, it takes me some you know emotion that that grabs me to something and right now for example that I'm I'm working in a concept because I'm working on my new album, 
So and that album has to do with this time, with the you know that we are kind of feel like haunted by you know even when you when you start writing at the beginning, you have certain weight of of, of writing you know, and I and I feel that I still uh, you know learning the way I want to express myself because one I once I write my songs that, that songs it doesn't belong to me anymore, you know because it's a process. You know, so and sometimes I'm I'm writing about something that the the emotion is super far from where at the end, uh, uh, you know, it gets at the end uh, like a, a result. You know, so s sometimes depending on that, um, sometimes I I just like um, have the the music. Sometimes I just have uh, there there are songs that I just uh, I came home and I just like, and the song just like with music and lyrics all together. But that is really, yeah, that's incredible because that's something that is like, it's just happening. It's like, but sometimes it's not because, and sometimes, sometimes maybe we put a lot of like, uh, you know, like rationality on the, on the, on the songs. And that moment is when I have to stop because there is when, because I'm just like, you know, pushing myself in order to get a, a, a specific result. So that and at that time, I have to just like let it go, you know, and wait until that moment comes again and, and you know, and find, you know, and to end that process. Otherwise, there are songs that I have for almost 20 years and they are still not a song, you know. There's still an idea that could be a song. Yeah, I have a story. I have a friend composer that says like, well, I wake up every day and as a professional, I have any other profession, I work on composing songs and if the music if the muse comes then even greater right <laughs> if the muse comes and visits me even greater but so he establishes a routine of you know you know professional uh as a professional as a songwriter yeah yeah john what, what's your um well um you mentioned listening so much and as i get older as a performer and a writer i find listening is more is 90 percent of it and that includes listening to myself and kind of uh, when I start a song, when I'm writing songs, I hear song titles all the time and song ideas. Uh, when I'm not writing songs, I have to dig for them. So um, I do, like you said, if I sit down, I need a new song. You know, I need to do something new because that's what makes me feel so much better about myself in some way. Then uh, that's a conscious process. And I'll work through ideas. I find um, I commit myself to playing as many, uh, just a, a stream of consciousness, and I'll record it. I'll just turn on a recorder and play for 10 or 15 minutes. And uh, sometimes an idea will just slip out of your unconscious, you know, because we think too much. Mm -hmm. We're controlling our thoughts. And then so by doing that, um, you can... Sometimes that idea just drops in almost by mistake. And, and like you said, many composers say that, or musicians, great musicians say that they're just a vessel. They're not really, it's not really theirs. It's just something that passes through them like that, mm -hmm. like that quick song. So those are the moments you want, but those are not the things I have every day. So I have an everyday process, you know, and it's um, like in songwriting, you know, in the, bro in the classic era, they talk about uh, balancing uh, repetition and, pl and uh, pleasant mm -hmm. sounds. So I'm, I'm looking at the amount of repetition. I'm looking at contrast. If I have more than one section, I like each one to start in a different, on a different chord or a different thought. Uh, I tend to write songs with the same rhythm all the way through, and then the chorus sounds too much like the verse. So I try and have a different... Uh, uh, harmonic rhythm, rate of chord change, uh, different message, the chorus is simpler. And a lot of times uh, I overcomplicate myself, you know? And so at that point, uh, I look at the song in terms of clarity. I play it for my wife, you know, or other people. And uh, just say, well, I don't understand that. It's like, okay, then I didn't make it clear. So, um, and one of the things I ask when I'm stuck with lyrics is who, what, where, when, and why, you know? And uh, a lot of times we write the big important verse first, but that's not the first verse. 
you know, and that's where the who, what, where, and why comes in. So there's, there's processes and techniques, there's ways that I use my musical background, my experience to, to creatively observe what I'm doing. It's more observation than criticism, yeah. you know? If we can take the self-criticism out and self-loathing, then things go much better. Mm-hmm. Well, I'm very glad we, we chose this theme because there's so many roads and avenues that we can now explore, right? Uh, from uh, all the social impacts to the process of creation of the song itself. But I do, because of the lack of time, I, I do would like to end our, our uh, talk with, uh, with the real deal, with the music itself, with the, with, the, with the final product, the finished product. So you have, if you would play a couple of songs for us. A couple of just me? Sí. <laughs> Con la guitarra, you have you. <laughs> Is Just to close idea. out, no, but idea. I mean, we're, como si fuera aquí muy bohemio, tú sabes, muy improvisadito. Uh, yo le traigo la guitarra, I know I put her on the spot, but and then she hasn't played that guitar ever because that's the guitar I have to do for, for teaching. Maybe just a couple of songs and, and, and tell us a story about it, maybe. Uh, Um, I, I think I'm going to play my first song. <laughs> and, um, and it's a song that it's, uh, it's still, still with me because it talks about the modernity, how modernity can, you know, like um, be uh, in the middle of our journey, you know. At the same time, that it's good to have the modernity, to, you know, the modernity, but sometimes we have to be careful because otherwise we will lose our, our legacy, you know. And this is kind of like, um, kind of ebuleria afro, you know, that has to do with the theater, my time on the theater. So the, the canción se llama Tomando el Centro, it's taking the center. Ay, no sé cómo sacar ese golpe que llevo dentro que al final la noche termina y te anudas al centro ay no sé cómo sacar ese golpe que llevo dentro si al final la noche termina y te anudas al centro al centro del mismo cuerpo vamos a mirarnos por dentro échale tierra al acontecimiento que en el camino van a crecer piedras antes que amanezca y dale rueda 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 las ideas que tiene luz roja en la cabeza ten cuidado que la modernidad te usa como pieza de vestir, oye bien. Ay, no sé cómo sacar ese golpe que llevo dentro. Si al final la noche termina y te anudas al centro. Ay, no sé cómo sacar ese golpe que llevo dentro. Si al final la noche termina y te anudas al centro. Oye, vamos a mirarnos por dentro. Oye, tú dale rueda, 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 rueda. Oye, la es que seguro que una lágrima, otra lágrima queda. Este es el momento del coro, por ejemplo. Ya que estamos yaceando. Maestro, agarra la guitarra, por favor. Oye, dale rueda, da, 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 da.
dale re. No me importa si en el camino se te cruzan los problemas. De rueda, esa es la realidad que seguro despertarte pueda. Dale, hoy es el llanto, mañana será el canto y una música que llega. Dale, no, 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 seguro que una lágrima cayó en la arena. Dale, que la vida es una sola y es para disfrutarla entera. Dale, rueda. No se puede pedir más, no se puede pedir más. I mean, I, I'm, I'm so, so happy. I'm so thrilled to have each one of you. Thank you so much. Um, this is, I think, it reflects what the festival is about. It's about community, it's about unity, it's about bringing the music in the first place, right? And, uh, and you know, friendship. So thanks so much. Muchas gracias. Gracias a todos ustedes. Thank you, Lisa, once again. And thank you, everybody, for attending. Muchas gracias por estar aquí.